Hi, I'm Marsha Martin, and I am having conversations with candidates. Today, uh, I have with me uh, Representative Jonathan Singer from the State House, and he is term limited and uh, will be running this fall, is running uh, for uh, county commissioner in District 2. So welcome, Jonathan. Can you introduce yourself briefly? And then I have some questions for you. Absolutely. Well, thanks. Thanks for doing this. I, I want to say um, to all the folks out there, I hope you're staying healthy and I hope you're well right now. Um, and and while well, it's been my honor to serve House District 11, the State House, for the last eight and a half years, um, I really just um, appreciate the opportunity to be able to communicate with folks and you to be able to be that um, conduit to make sure that people understand what choices they have this, um, this June. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, uh, we always start out with, why are you running from county commissioner? You have choices, which are, you know, not to run, run for the Senate. But, uh, so why are you running for county commissioner and uh, what do you hope to accomplish there? Uh, county commission is probably the most important job that you may have never heard of. Um, there are three county commissioners that oversee half a billion dollar budget and, and I have to say, as somebody who's a former county employee working on the front lines protecting our kids in our child welfare division and making sure that at-risk adults um, were kept safe um, and able to stay home, um, when the majority of your half a billion dollar budget, or not the majority, but the plurality of your half a billion dollar budget is in the human service system, uh, it would be my honor to be able to support our progress that we've made in our county to make sure that generations from now will be able to look at this as an example across the state and across the nation. Uh, but on top of that, we're in the middle of a climate crisis. And it's our county that can put forward a Green New Deal for Boulder County, something that will actually uh, bring workers and the environmental movement together. You know, I'm, I'm supported by leaders in our labor movement and our environmental movement, everyone from skilled trades all the way to the Sierra Club. It's time to bring those two together because we don't have time to waste. And our county has the resources, the infrastructure to do this right now. Um, and, and then the last two things really, um, one, I know that another huge part of our budget is our county sheriff's department. That's where our jail is. Our county does a great job of housing and feeding and providing for the health care of people in the least effective way possible, and that's called our criminal justice system. And so it's time to flip the script, recognize what the Black Lives Matter movement is about, and bring new ideas to the table that brings forward real accountability, and at the same time creates a more humane system where we treat each other as neighbors, not as criminals. And a big part of that is going to include affordable housing. As somebody who lost their own housing just a couple of years ago when my rent doubled, we need to make sure that every single person here who has a job can afford to live in this great community. Okay, um, that was pretty much your platform, I think. So um, uh, some of the questions I had planned to ask will be drilling down on a couple of those points. Um, but uh, the second legislative, the second half or the second third of the third third of the legislative session, um, uh, has some surprises in it. And um, one of them is uh, uh, referring the Gallagher Amendment to this fall's ballot. Um, so uh, that is a sweeping change. It makes, uh, it, it's potentially a fiscal rescue for not just Boulder County, but all of the counties in the state. Uh, if it's done right and if the people vote for it, uh, and we have this impending uh, recession. It hasn't been long enough to be a recession yet, but um, all the other signs are there. Um, yeah. So uh, could you talk about that? First of all, will you vote for the referendum uh, in the House? I'm not going to ask you how you're going to vote on the ballot. Um, and uh, what what will your campaign message be if it goes to the ballot? Um, what, will your, what will your campaign as county commissioner say about this? 
You, you know, um, tax policy is probably the most dry but most important thing that we can talk about. Um, because I believe that our budget is a moral contract with our community. And unfortunately, Gallagher, while it was really well intentioned, um, to make sure that people weren't cash poor, but house rich. Um, and we, that is hitting us harder in Boulder County than probably other places. Um, at the same time, if we don't come up with a fix, kiss your fire districts, your library districts, any other special district that you've got right now, our school districts, kiss any bells and whistles goodbye, maybe we may lose entire school districts if we don't fix Gallagher. That is not an exaggeration. So we need action and this needs to go to the voters and the voters need to be given a choice. Um, I'd like to see some compromises in there to protect people who are, um, like I said, financially under-resourced but happen to live in a house where the property value has ballooned. Um, but this artificial, um, process that was created really doesn't um, really doesn't help. Um, our St. Marion School District uh, is, is um, supporting this um, tax fix and, and in all likelihood uh, I'll be supporting the tax fix as well um, and I'll certainly be making sure that something goes on the ballot this year because we cannot sit on our hands and Tabor does not allow me to fix these things by itself. This needs to go to you as the voter. Absolutely. I'd like to take Tabor along with it sometimes, but baby steps. 271 is also coming up, and this is really important. This will put in a progressive income tax. If you haven't had a chance to sign the petition, sign it. Um, there's no reason that millionaires and billionaires pay the same tax rate as people who make minimum wage. And mm -hmm. this is an opportunity to actually help um, our budget crunch right now to be able to afford the things that we need to for our teachers in our schools, and at the same time, be a little bit of a tax break for, for those of us who are making under a million or a billion dollars a year. <laughs> you know, I have often had that uh, feeling about property taxes, that, that there is no reason why someone in a five or 7,000 square foot McMansion pays the same rate as someone in a 1,200 uh, square foot house that happens to be in a great neighborhood and so has appreciated. Um, it, there ought to be something we could do about that too, uh, in terms of property taxes. Um, I don't know whether that's harder, maybe you do. Um, you know, it's, it's a really good question. I, I, I think, you know, um, when we look at square, when we look at putting any, any sort of artificial formula in there, there we need to correct for, for exceptions and that's what becomes challenging. Um, even in residential property versus commercial property. Uh, if you have a large family, maybe you live in a bigger house. I um, mean, it's, it's a worthwhile conversation. The, I think the only thing that we can't keep is the status quo because it's, it's, it's going to decimate our districts and our budgets. Yes, that's, that is certainly true. Well, um, the, uh, the state house has a heavy lift in front of it, getting this worked out in, uh, in three weeks. Is that the target? I think we might be done even sooner than that. Um, wow. It's very possible that this could be our last week at the Capitol. It's very possible we could go in another one or two weeks. Um, there's not been a lot of dry eyes. There were $3.2 billion in cuts that were made this year because of the economic downturn and because of Tabor. Uh, and and uh, there were not a lot of dry eyes in the state Capitol this week or last week um, because we know those are human lives that are, are being affected. This is really now up to our local governments to step up to the plate and do the right thing for um, our at-risk and our frontline communities. With what money? Well, uh, we've, we've, gotta, we, we've gotta do two things um, at the local level and I give our counties a lot of credit. They stepped up to the plate and said, hey, state of Colorado, you're getting these federal dollars. What are you going to do to make sure local governments get it? Um, we've, and the state has stepped up to the plate on that one. We need to use the bully pulpit to go to our federal government to say, if you want a Green New Deal or a jobs program or a housing assistance program, it's time for our local governments, especially in a local control state like Colorado, to say, we know how to spend it best. Don't make these federal programs, make these grants for local governments, cities and counties. And then the third thing that we can do, and, and we've done a great job of this in the past, is really appeal to the voters in Boulder County and in Colorado. 
um, of Boulder County and Longmont and City of Boulder to, to say, you know what? You may not be willing to accept a permanent tax increase on something, but what if we did a worthy cause initiative? And you see what that worthy cause initiative has done for things like early childhood education. We've got a long ways to go, um, but I really have a lot of faith that our voters who do happen to have a little bit more means um, to be able to step up to the plate in the middle of a crisis, just like we did after the 2013 floods. One would hope. Um, another thing that I expect to have happen, at least if we have a new administration in 2021, is that uh, there will be a lot of federal infrastructure grants as stimulus coming down uh, from the federal government. Um, uh, sort of along the lines of, of ERA in 2009 and 10. Um, uh, ERA was handicapped. I was working in the smart grid industry at the time, and ERA was handicapped by the lack of shovel-ready uh, projects for grant applications. As county commissioner, can you find ways, do you believe, to help um, either with partnerships or with really brief influxes of money to help the municipalities uh, prepare shovel-ready proposals uh, so that we can get this money that, that we have our fingers crossed will be, will be coming. Fast, right? Well, first of all, I mean, shovel-ready is, 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 is uh, the wrong term that should have never been used. That's not your fault. That's the federal government's fault. Um, actually, pretty much everything is not your fault in the federal government. <laughs> So, um, so, you know, when we look at this, um, my biggest frustration with, with the reason we haven't finished Fast Tracks yet and had it built up to Longmont and Boulder is because mm -hmm. it wasn't a shovel-ready project. So when um, Recovery Act dollars came through um, during the Obama administration, you know, we gave up our own fair share to the West Line and the South Line saying, you know what, you're going to double your money right now. Don't forget about us. They did. And I feel like. I think they forgot about us. I'm sorry. And so um, we need to find ways to start getting projects shovel ready, whether that's, you know, making paperwork or the people work or whatever it is. Um, and then our county has done a really good job in the past of working with um, other communities and knowing when to step up and when to step back. Uh, I bring this up during the flood. Um, you know, the state and the county were uh, there to provide resources for local communities. Longmont has a great city manager. Um, Longmont has a great city staff. Um, they're able to do a lot of things on their own better, faster, and cheaper um, than going through a larger bureaucracy. Don't James forget Tam about us. <laughs> and I don't just say that because you're on city council. Um, I, I, I would <coughs> say you're on city council. Um, uh, on the flip side, um, I, I would also say that um, smaller communities like Jamestown um, it, it's not their fault, but when you have a population of under a thousand people, you're not going to have that administrative infrastructure. And that's when it's time for your county and the state to step up and say, we're going to work with you. We're going to take your best ideas and we're going to make them work. And, um, and this is exactly the time where we can start talking about how do we make shovel ready projects that will increase mass transit and other parts of what a Green New Deal might look like. Um, and, and also increase our infrastructure on trails and open space to be able to maintain those things similar to what the original New Green, Green Deal did, uh, excuse me, New Deal did uh, back in the 1930s and 40s. Yes. My own father didn't starve because of the WPA, so <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a fan of that model. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm torn in terms of the order of questions. Since we're mostly talking about the, the county, there are people um, talking about petitioning uh, Boulder County um, to do its own fracking ban. Um, I like that a lot better than the other way that's being exercised here um, to get a fracking ban in place. Uh, why do you think that Boulder County has not gone for a fracking ban? And do you think that you would support doing that uh, if you are uh, elected to the county commission? 
So those are both great questions. Um, and, and, and first of all, I, I will say that I think it is, uh, climate change is the largest existential threat to our entire planet, not just the county. And we've got to step up and do our part. Um, when I worked on Senate bill, um, uh, on the Senate bill last year to give local governments the authority to mm -hmm. do everything up to banning fracking, um, I did that on purpose um, because I knew that our state didn't have the political will to stand up to the um, oil and gas industry and to our fossil fuel industry. And so um, this is a land use decision. And so I'm always careful that I'm not potentially um, showing prejudice before I make a, a land use decision. But I would say as a policy, I've always believed that the state of Colorado should have enacted a fracking ban. And that at the very least, a moratorium needs to be put into place to give um, people a, a real sense of, of what the dangers and risks are. Um, in terms of going to the ballot, this is a really loaded question, and so I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, I really think in terms of going to the ballot, first of all, um, it's a really hard to go to the ballot when you're not a home rule county. And so we should be, um, one, stepping up to the plate to allow petitioners to really petition their county government. Part of that might include putting the county commissioners putting something on the ballot to consider becoming a home rule county. Like I said, that, there's a lot to unpack there, um, so I don't want to be cavalier about it, but I also fundamentally believe uh, that um, democracy works and that the will of the voters should be enacted. And so we need to put this in front of the voters to give them the choice. Um, I give our county commissioners a lot of credit at the same time. They have done a very good job of um, crossing their T's and dotting their I's to um, hold off a lot of the fracking industry. But when they're looking at fracking over open space right now, not just my land, but literally our land that mm -hmm. we preserve for everyone to enjoy, and we're putting people at risk with air quality levels similar to that of downtown Los Angeles over Union Reservoir. And we see the scientists that whistleblow on that get fired from public institutions We've got to be in this for, for the fight of our lives and fight on this like our lives depend on it. Because if it's not our lives, it's our kids' lives and their kids. Uh -huh. What, um, just as a passing follow-up, uh, if Boulder County becomes a, a home rule county, uh, does that have any impact on the home rule abilities of the home rule municipalities in, the, in Boulder County? Or is there enough separation of powers that that doesn't happen? That is for a whole other segment entirely. <laughs> and I'm so glad you brought that up because I want us to be able to have this conversation. It's been brought up a lot of times, but we need an open and public forum. My goal, if elected, is to have town halls on these issues in, in communities, not just relying on uh, people to come down to Pearl Street to the courthouse there, or the old courthouse, and have the conversation there. But, you know, let's when social distancing is over, let's have these conversations one-on-one -on -one between your, commi your commissioners and, and, and uh, average residents. Um, short answer to your question is no, it doesn't really impinge on, on home rule municipalities. It's actually, home rule municipalities have a lot more breadth and power than a home rule county would. And, I would expect. And, and, and counties have historically been seen as a uh, political subdivision of the state. Uh, and, and really, if, unless the state sort of enumerates something in law, the county cannot do it. Uh, you know what? In a county that's as big as Boulder, I'm not sure that's the best way to do things. I don't want to be taking my orders from people like me at the state legislature. I want to be listening to my community members. Okay. Well, that's a good answer. It's 1030. We got started late, so we probably have a few more minutes. And... Uh, uh, people would think we were crazy if I didn't ask you about the police reform bill, especially since you were sheltering in place the night the shots were fired at the Capitol. Um, so uh, what do you think about that bill? And uh, what do you think people's expectations should be uh, 
if a uh, police reform bill passes? Oh, should they expect to see immediate impact? Is it going to take a long time? Uh, that kind of stuff. You know, um, I was out there with the protesters last week um, when, unfortunately, we were shot at. Um, I've been out there with the protesters almost every day since then. Uh, and this is such a breath of fresh air to be able to see so many people out in the streets fighting for this. And we would not have a bill without people stepping up to the plate. And I'm so proud to be a co-sponsor of that bill because I've been working on this issue my entire career. Um, I think that this is an amazing first step. I'm a co-sponsor, but this is not the only, this is not the beginning and it is definitely not the end. Um, I was able to pass a bill this year to make sure that our dispatchers who get mental injuries, PTSD on the job, can take time off without worrying about whether or not they're gonna get fired. Um, we need people who are trained um, and ready to work and held accountable when they're on the job. And you know, I worked on a bill just last year to make sure that when there's police officer force used, that people get the help that they need so that when they go back onto the force, they don't have an itchy trigger, trigger finger, um, that they're out there to protect and to serve. They are, they are um, our protectors. They are, are not warriors. They are not um, men of, and women of military. Um, they, they are our guardians. So, um, so I, I think that the short answer is yes, but the longer answer is this is something I've been working on for years and we've got a long way to go even after, uh, even if this bill is able to pass through the House and the Senate. You know, that may be not just you alone. I'm not going to give you that much credit, but, but you and others like you who have been working on this for such a long time may be the reason uh, that the hurry up bill doesn't have some of the aspects of a hurry up bill, but it's, um, uh, it's, it's really pretty good. Um, nevertheless, um, I want to say, and your, your point about PTSD help um, uh, speaks to it, is, is that what you have to do really is to get the right force. Um, uh, you know, if you don't get elected to the county commission, you should consider joining the Longmont Police Force, Jonathan, because uh, we have a lot of social workers already um, on, on our safety um, force, a lot of safety officers who are trained and, and worked as, as uh, social workers. Um, but you have to manage for a profile that is different from the profile that uh, I think uh, a lot of police forces are composed of right now. And um, I think that's why people are talking about defunding the police. But uh, having worked in local government for a while now, uh, I don't think that will work either. Um, you know, I think we need to hope, the, our best hope is for a very controlled trans, transition of, of what the police force should be like. Um, do you agree with that view? And what do you think can be done to make sure that we have a, an equitable approach to policing as soon as possible. There, there's a lot there, and and you know, I'm an office. I'm, I'm in an office across the street from the Capitol right now, so you may be able to hear the protesters. Um, and you know, first thing is that we need to listen to what the protesters are saying. People have never come out in this level for this long on any issue, and I am not going to presume to know all the answers. But what I can say is what we've set up in Longmont is something that um, I've been actually working to reproduce across the state of Colorado. We have a co-responder system now where if someone is exhibiting mental health issues, they're actually mm -hmm. able to talk to a professional in the place and the time. And when I did a ride along with law enforcement, we had a licensed mental health professional there. I can count at least five arrests or mental health holds that were avoided. Mm -hmm. So heartache that we saved on that but it, that that doesn't go far enough because this is not just a mental health issue this is a race issue and and we cannot deny our 400 years of history of uh, starting in 1619 
and we, we need to deal with that head on. We need to make sure that not only are we kicking out the bad officers and protecting the good officers through good, strong whistleblower protections, but we also need to be having that bigger and broader conversation about making sure that we are hiring new law enforcement officers that are attracted to this from all walks of life, from African Americans, Latinos and Hispanics, um, to get make sure that community members know that they're valued uh, for who they are and that we value them so much we'd like them to work with us. And yes, there is some time that we do need to de defund some parts of this. We do not need military-like weapons on every single police force out there. And the federal money that's come down for that, you know, we should probably be turning some of it back. And, mm -hmm. and, and so this is, there's a lot to unpack here. The last thing I'll say, you know, I'm working with Tay Anderson, um, who's a school board member, the youngest African-American um, school uh, board member um, in the state of Colorado, who um, right now is working on taking our school resource officers, our police officers out of our schools. And, and this is an incredibly important conversation to have. We wanna end the school to prison pipeline. There's no reason that anyone shouldn't uh, you know, call uh, at school if they need a police officer, but there are community approaches to this that can work a lot better, especially when you consider that there's only about one school counselor for every 300 kids. That's worse in some parts of our state and some parts of our county. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got a lot to do. Defunding doesn't mean cutting funding entirely. It's reallocating your resources to what's going to actually preserve health and safety and stop a racist system um, that needs to be dealt with head on. Yeah, certainly they don't need tanks and RoboCop uniforms um, in the... <laughs> Well, that's what they are. I mean, you saw them in the movies first. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, I agree with you. It doesn't mean, well, maybe to some people it does, but it doesn't mean let's not have any police and start over from scratch, leaving a gap. Um, we have to have a different kind of a police force in some places. Do you consider Longmont a model that is worth taking uh, to a wider audience? Because I'll tell you, I do. Yes, um, I think there's always room for improvement, but I think community, community policing um, that we've done here in Longmont is far better than so many other places. It's not to say that it's perfect, um, but I think the fact that we have a co-responder system where we're prioritizing mental health over, um, over crime and punishment is a great step in the right direction. You need to have a strong district attorney's office and a strong sheriff's office that's working with you in concert. It's our sheriff mm -hmm. at the county that, work, that runs the jails. Um, they need to be working in concert with our DAs uh, to be able to make sure that we're providing the right kind of resources for people when they need it. Um, and, and Longmont is being looked at as a model. I can tell you there are folks in Colorado Springs now that are going, gosh, Jonathan, what is going on up in Longmont? We want to do that here in conservative Colorado Springs. That's not just from people, that is from people inside our law enforcement departments. So we've got a long ways to go. But I would say this is, Longmont is a great place to start and let's build on it. All right. Well, thank you, Jonathan. I think we're, we're getting up to the eye glaze point of time. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but this has been a great interview and I, um, uh, I'm going to give you a chance to, to make a, a closing statement. If you could keep it to a couple of minutes, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, I, I just want to thank you again for, for doing this. Um, everyone, June 30th, your ballot should be coming out um, starting about June 8th or June 9th. June 30th is the deadline to have those returned to your county clerk's office. You have a choice this year, and democracy is about choices, and I'm proud of, I'm proud of that fact. Um, but... I've been on the front lines in Boulder County my entire adult life in one way or another as a caseworker. And now I'm ready to take the experience in flipping the script, changing the system systemically at the state and bringing those programs together at the local level. There's only three county commissioners and I wanna be the one to be the voice of those who've never stood up, been able no, never had someone stand up for them at the county commission. Um, I want to be the voice 
of labor and the environment and maintain our beautiful open spaces that we've always had to keep our character and at the same time make sure that people who work here can afford to live here. It's going to be a tough line to, to, to tow and I'm going to need all of you. And win or lose, I just want to thank you all for this opportunity because it's been a real honor. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, and uh, glad to be able to talk to you. It's a fascinating uh, time to be running for office, especially, you know, changing horses as you are. And uh, uh, I look forward to this election um, because, yeah, I hope we vote as well as we demonstrate. Oh, I, I think we'll be pleasantly surprised. There's no time like a crisis to show who we really are. And, and I'm optimistic. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. And I hope we'll do this again closer to the election. Thanks again. Okay. Bye-bye.